So it's been four one and y'all know this is stop on the next Okay, uh, we're going to get started here in just another minute or so. Uh, if you uh, have not been here previously, we want to welcome you to our study. Uh, if you have not picked up a copy or the copies of the definitions and the charts over here, please feel free to get those. Uh, the information that's on the screen, we had up, that up last week. We're going to continue working our way through these verses tonight. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, a word of prayer and ask God to help us uh, grasp and embrace these truths that we'll discover as we go through the study. So. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you today for the blessings you've given to us. We pray for this class tonight as we open your word and study it. You have said throughout your word that if we seek knowledge and seek your wisdom, that you will provide it to us. Yeah. Uh, and we ask for that tonight as we open up uh, these pages, especially as we talk about the end of time events, uh, that you would give us as much understanding as we can have in this uh, lifetime. Yeah. We know some answers we won't uh, discover until we get there, but uh, there are many that we can discover. So as we work our way through your word, help us to be enlightened by your spirit uh, to grasp those meanings. Bless our time together, and we pray that what we say and what we do tonight would bring honor and glory to you, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to continue working our way through these verses of scripture because the topic we're studying beginning last week and now tonight is the topic of the Antichrist. Uh, just kind of a reminder to you, uh, we, I used this kind of an uh, illustration last week a little bit. This is like putting a puzzle together. Uh, we're going to be going through and looking at specific events or incidences or individuals or scriptures. Uh, as we get toward the end of the class, we'll be able to kind of pull all that together into hopefully a, a picture uh, of the end time events that will make it a little bit clearer for us to understand. Uh, I recall growing up in church as a little boy, probably pre-teenager, maybe teenager, church had a revival, our church had a revival and had an evangelist come in. And on the first night, he made this statement. He said to all of you who come every night, on the last night, I am going to tell you the secret to understanding the book of Revelation. Uh, and so every night the church is packed and all. So that night came and he preached his sermon and we were about ready to go home. And he said, oh, I think I made a promise uh, that if you came, I was going to tell you the secret to understanding the book of Revelation. Here it is. Read it. Believe it. He said, thank you for having me. <laughs> but you know, there is some truth in that. <clears throat> there are some things, as we read through this, we're going to have to just believe it. Whether we can process it or not, whether we can make sense of it or not. Uh, somebody put it this way. If you could read <clears throat> everything God has written, and understand them in their entirety and in their completeness, that would mean you're as smart as God is. And so, <clears throat> speaking for all of us unanimously, we know that's not true. <clears throat> so, uh, we are going to have to take some things uh, kind of at faith, but there's a lot of things we can learn that we don't have to take it by faith because the Word of God, when you look at it carefully and honestly, will spell some of that out for you. We looked at two, two passages last week. I just I don't want to go through all that again. 
Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. Uh, both of these passages introduce us to uh, the Antichrist. And uh, in Daniel chapter 7, one of the things that we found in that chapter was the goal of the Antichrist. What, what is he after? What is, what is it that he wants to accomplish? And um, in Daniel chapter 7, uh, beginning, I'm going to just read a couple of words here. Uh, in verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints for the Most High, shall intend to change times and laws, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, time, and a half the time. We already talked about that being a three and a half year span of time. Uh, notice what the Antichrist wants. He wants to uh, be in control. He wants to be in charge. <laughs> I had an interview this past week with, with a couple of people, and uh, the gentleman said, uh, what, would, what would you like to do uh, in this position? And I said, be in charge. <laughs> and I, of course, was joking. And I got home, and I thought that, you know, I don't know, he doesn't know me from Madeline's Hascat. Maybe he thought I was serious. So I sent him an email back, hey, and I said, hey, just joking, you know, that, that wasn't. But that's what the Antichrist wants. He's going to stand up against God himself. He's going to try to make himself to be as if he were God. He's going to demand that we treat him as God. So that's what he's after. In chapter 8, we saw his methods of how he operates. Uh, we talked about how that he had the ability to understand sinister schemes, how he was cunning, how he was deceitful, uh, and all those things about how he operates. So we're going to begin in chapter 9 and verse 27. We actually have already read this verse a couple of different times, uh, but we're going to start there uh, and continue with our examination of the role of the Antichrist in the end time events. Daniel 9, 27 says this, then he, and that's going to be whom? The Antichrist. the Antichrist. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And again, how long is one week? Seven years. Seven years. That goes back to the other verses uh, of Daniel's uh, vision of the 70 weeks. But in the middle of the week, that would be how many years? Three and a half. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So that latter part, we'll deal with that at a future event. We're going to talk about just the timing of this right now in the process. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene and he's going to convince the nation of Israel that he is their Messiah. We talked about this uh, in the past. Let me just capsulize what we said. Uh, he will be presenting himself to the Jewish people as their Messiah, as their Redeemer, as their Deliverer. Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me, but another shall come in his own name, and him you will receive, referring to the Messiah. And so what is it that allows him to come on the scene and enter into this treaty with the nation of Israel? The only thing that's going to allow that is he has to convince them, and will convince them, he is their Messiah. He is described in Revelation 6, which we'll come to much later, uh, either tonight or next week, uh, as the rider of the white horse who comes with a bow, but with no error. That is to say, he has the appearance of being a military person, but he really has no one. He's coming in his own strength. He's going to come. And so he's going to begin this journey, seven-year journey, called the tribulation period, where at the beginning he's going to have to convince Israel that he is their Messiah. And in doing that, he is going to allow them to do two primary things. One, rebuild the temple. And two, resume their Old Testament animal sacrifices. 
Someone asked the other day about the rebuilding of the temple and how that can happen. And basically my answer to that is, I don't know, but I know it can and will happen. Uh, earthquakes happen. Uh, storms happen. Uh, wars happen. There could be a host of explanations for how that mosque of Omar gets destroyed, the Golden Dome or, uh, Mosque on the Temple Mount. But however that happens, that's going to be something God will be taking care of. But in the doing of that, he is going to reclaim that space, tell the Jews you can rebuild your temple, uh, and resume the sacrifice. So for three and a half years, those first three and a half years of the tribulation period, that's what the Antichrist is going to do. Beyond letting them rebuild their temple and resume their Old Testament sacrifice, sacrificial worship, he is going to also begin to solve all of the other problems and issues and challenges Israel as a nation faces. <coughs> Remember we said that in Daniel 8 it says he understands sinister, sinister schemes, he's cunning, deceitful, he is a politician, he's a negotiator, and he is going to be able to, as they say, sell ice uh, to Eskimos. <laughs> Uh, he is going to be a person who can convince pretty much anybody and everybody of what he wants them to believe. There's going to be a supernatural component to this. We haven't gotten into any of that, but he's going to be able to do great miracles. And so it's going to be hard for people to not give him uh, recognition as being this master leader. Why is he going to, what's the benefit of him solving Israel's problem? Because when he first comes on the scene, he has no authority, he has no power, he has no ability to do what he ultimately wants to do, which is destroy the nation of Israel. But in those first three and a half years, as the rest of the world stands by and looks at what he's doing over there, they're going to come to him and say, hey, can you help us? We have these situations, what should we do about this? And the condition he will lay down for solving their problems as well is you will have to turn control of your government over to me. You'll have to trust me. I've already proven that I can take, and there is no place on earth with greater conflict than the Middle East. Agreed? And if you can solve the problems of the Middle East, you can pretty much probably solve almost anything. That's going to be the mindset. The reality is, he's using those first three and a half years to accrue the power, to accrue the military force, to accrue the control of the financial markets and the economy of the various parts of the world to where he will truly be the head of the one world government. There is going to be a unified one world government in the end of time. There's going to be a unified one world religion. I remember, gosh, I don't know how many years ago it was, but uh, it was in a magazine article I was looking at, or a magazine, uh, and, and when I flipped the page, there was a, uh, an ad or something. It said, if there's only one God, why so many religions? Not long ago, some religious professors in schools began to speculate on an idea that there's really only one God. He has just revealed himself by various names. So Allah is also God. Buddha is God. Confucius was God. Uh, Shinto was God. Uh, and so if that continues to be promoted, the idea to an unsuspecting and biblically illiterate world, it's going to make sense. Well, yeah, if there's only one God, you know, we ought to get all this together. However that unfolds, however that unfolds is God's business, but we're going to end up with a one world government and a one world religion. The Antichrist is going to be the head of the one world government. The false prophet, which we'll come to next, is going to be the head of the one world church. 
that promotes the worship of the Antichrist. So, as little as one by one, as various countries began to allow the Antichrist to embrace uh, and solve some of their problems, uh, he gains more and more power and more and more control. Once he has enough power, enough control of military, uh, of armies, of navies, uh, of the economy, of the financial world, once he has enough control to do that, he is at that midway point, halfway into the tribulation period, to where he then, according to Daniel 9, 27, breaks the treaty. How does he break the treaty? I covered this, I got ahead of myself last week and we covered it a little bit, but just to back up for a second. Uh, at that midpoint, three and a half years in, when he's got the control he needs to have to launch the all-out effort to annihilate the nation of Israel and the people of God on the earth, he makes his move, and he does so by entering the temple and positioning himself in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, <laughs> demanding that the people do what? Worship, Worship him as God. He stops all the animal sacrifices, and as we talked about last week, how do the Jewish people know immediately Whenever he does that, that he is not the Messiah. He was not allowed under the law to enter the temple because he was not a Levite priest. He was not of the tribe of Levi. And therefore, they know their Messiah would never have done that. And so they immediately rebel against his leadership which then allows him to begin his attempt to destroy the nation of Israel. Revelation beginning in chapter 6 all the way through to chapter 18. That is the, the judgment of God upon the earth along with the Antichrist and Satan doing their effort to destroy the nation of Israel. And all the stuff is described there, all of the seven vials, the seven bowls, the seven thunders, the seven seals, and, and all of that horrendous uh, loss of life, horrendous judgment, horrendous um, effort to destroy basically everything on the earth. All of that takes place in those chapters, which we'll get to down the road here a little ways. <coughs> so this begins with a treaty between the Antichrist and Israel. Halfway through, the treaty is broken. He begins to annihilate the Jewish nation. Satan uh, <laughs> Satan is a powerful being. Are we agreed on that? But he's not God. Are we agreed on that? He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He's not omnipotent. He's more powerful than you and I are, but he's not all-powerful. Uh, he has none of those attributes of God. Where I'm going with this is this, is to say this. Satan is going to do his best, but God is always going to be ahead of the game. I can't remember... Uh, much of anything anymore, I guess, but I don't remember if I told you this or not. <laughs> Some years ago, my wife's oldest sister, her and her husband lived in Jacksonville, and we went up to spend the weekend with them. And uh, got up there Friday night, Saturday morning, uh, got up and they were doing breakfast, and uh, Barbara said to Peggy, hey, there's some yard sales, and they were doing to go. She said, yeah, I'm ready now. <laughs> and so, you know, they were gonna leave. And so Tom and I said, no, we, no, we're gonna stay here. So Tom said to me, he said, hey, uh, let's play a game of checkers. Now let me, let me tell you something right now. If somebody says to you, let's play, let's play a game of checkers, and they pull out a handmade custom checkered board, <laughs> if you're smart, which I wasn't, you'll figure out I probably ought not to go down this road. <laughs> But, you know, my brother-in-law and anyway, whatever. And so he sets it all up and we start playing checkers, you know, and, and I'm just talking. I'm just, I said, I haven't played checkers in 30 years, whatever. And I said, we're just talking. And so 
uh, I move a checker, you know, that he moves one and I move one or whatever. And about maybe, maybe 30, 40 seconds, <laughs> he says, want to play again? <laughs> and I looked at my board and I've got no red checkers on my board. <laughs> He's got them all over there. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, okay. Then that's better. So we set them all up again. This time it was about 45 seconds. He said, you want to play again? I said, okay. I talked to him, I said, I'm going to have to watch this. I'm going to have to see what he does. So we set them all up and I'm sitting there staring at this board and I move my checker over this way and I'm watching him and he reaches for a checker over here, you know, whatever. And so I move it back and all. And so I stretched that game out to about a minute and a half. <laughs> Here's what I learned from that, which I did at the time. He went online and played chess and checkers all over the world with these, you know, geniuses. I figured out he was always three to four moves ahead of me no matter what I did. If I went here, he had three or four options he was going to exercise. If I went over here, whatever. He was always three to four moves ahead of me. And I'm telling you that little story, which is a true story, to say this, God will always be three to four moves ahead of Satan. Do you think Satan had a hand to play at stirring up the crowd when they were crying out to Pilate to crucify Jesus? You think he was helping to orchestrate his death? I'm sure he was. But you know what happened three days after he died? First words out of, I can't prove this, it's in the original Greek somewhere. First words out of Satan's mouth after three days was, uh-oh. <laughs> and I didn't see that coming. You know. God is going to step into this scenario. He's going to control it from a, stand, from a certain standpoint. He's going to let it unfold from another standpoint. But when that comes to an end, when this whole show wraps up, he wins. Which means what for us? We win. So, as Satan is manipulating and the Antichrist is doing all this manipulating and, and moving things around, Satan has always hated the nation of Israel. He's always tried to destroy Israel. Why? We're going to get that in Revelation, the 12th chapter, but it's because through, the, through Israel, the Messiah came, Jesus came. And he's, he's been on their case ever since. So all of this is going to play out just on God's timetable and just on God's way, but for a little while, it's going to look like Satan's in control. Now, fortunately, we're not going to be here experiencing that firsthand. But the Antichrist, that three and a half year break, is going to launch this effort to do what Satan has always wanted to do, which is basically annihilate the entire Jewish nation. Jesus said, except those days be shortened, over in Matthew 24, which we'll get to in just a moment, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be spared. No one would live. But for the elect's sake, I will shorten those days. So that's Daniel 9, 27. That deals with a process of how the Antichrist gains world control. Comes on the scene, manipulates Israel, convinces them he's their Messiah, begins to solve all of their major problems. The rest of the world begins to fall in line and say, hey, help us. And, yeah, I'll help you, but you'll have to turn over control of your government to me to do that, or give me control of your economy or your military to do all of those things. Once he has that under his control, he then reveals himself for who he really is. Daniel 11. Before I go then and read, does anybody have any questions about those verses? Daniel 9, 27. I just want to ask you the treaty that's between uh, Israel and who, who is the other? Antichrist. Between the Antichrist and Israel. No, 
No, it's the Antichrist. It's a treaty between the Antichrist. He says, I'm your Messiah, and I'm going to let you rebuild your temple, and I'm going to do all this, and I'm going to deliver you from all your enemies, but you've got to acknowledge that I'm your Messiah. Okay, anyone else? Daniel 11. Beginning in verse 36. Before we read that, let me let me tell you something. I, sh I should have told you this earlier. This this complicates some of this stuff. Um, the Hebrew language of which the Old Testament was written is a very challenging language. One of the things that is challenging about it is that it has no provision in their in their grammar and syntax for tense. There is no such thing as past tense or future tense. I don't know about North Carolina, but in Florida, if somebody says, ask the question, hey, uh, how far is it to Miami? You know what the usual answer is? Uh, about four hours. Of course, I mean, that depends on where you are in, where in Central Florida. If it's how far is it down to Miami? About four hours. And I said, I didn't ask how long it's going to take. I said, how far is it? See, we are consumed, are we not, with time? We don't really care how far it is. We don't know how, much, how long it's going to take us to get there. Well, I'm characteristically to how we are, the Hebrew language was more focused on what happened, not when it happened. Consequently, there are no past tense, uh, present tense, future tense. There's no um, past, present, future perfect. You know, there's none of those tenses. They have what they call completed action or incomplete action, uncompleted action. That's all they have. If they're not concerned with when did this happen, uh, they're concerned with what happened. And the reason I'm telling you that is because when the prophets wrote in the Old Testament and they wrote about things that God told them to put down, they always, but virtually always wrote whatever that was down in what they would call completed action. Because here was their thinking. If God said it, it's going to happen. And the only way they could convey that in that language structure was to write it as if it had already happened. So the completed action is often looked upon and translated as past tense stuff by our language because we have all these tense in there. So when you start studying Old Testament prophecies, you have to begin looking at things, and we'll have to touch on that somewhere down the road, where we're looking at a prophecy, and we say, well, that sounds like it's already happened. Well, it may have, it may not have. So that's going to be a complication we'll have to address in some of the other future texts. <laughs> going back to Daniel 11, verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will. This is again, we're talking about the Antichrist. The king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every, what? God, God little g. <clears throat> shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods. Shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. <clears throat> That's the economy. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance his glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. <clears throat> if we were going to be doing <clears throat> a in-depth, thorough study of all of these passages, number one, we'd be here till the Lord comes. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
what is talking about here is the Antichrist as the king, as the head of the one world government, is going to exalt himself above every every god, including the god of gods, or attempt to. And he is going to worship the god of fortresses and the god of wealth. He's going to control power and money. Have you heard about the Mark of the Beast? Heard anything about that in the past? If you have, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, the Mark of the Beast is going to dictate who can buy and sell because he's going to be in charge of the economy. And so what we're seeing here is the intention of the Antichrist is to exalt himself above every god, present himself to be God, demand that he be worshipped as God, and will deal forcefully and um, unbelievably strong-handed against anyone who chooses to not acknowledge him as God. And he will bring the forces of the economy and the military to bear to ensure that he is the king of the world and that he is in charge. Now, in the first three and a half years, this doesn't happen. But in the last three and a half years, it's all that does happen. It's because of the first three and a half years, he's in his ascendancy rising to power. But once he has it, he's now using that to do what Satan wanted him to do. And the God that um, his fathers did not know is most likely a reference to Satan himself. Because Satan is the one pulling the strings behind the scene controlling the Antichrist and enabling him to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. So we see, we look at the methods that he will use. He's going to use deceit. He's going to use cunningness. He's going to understand sinister schemes. He's going to manipulate people. He's going to be a politician. He's going to talk his way into becoming the Messiah of Israel. He's going to convince them of who, that that's who he is. We've seen uh, the methods he will use. We've seen the process where that's going to take place. He's going to get into a treaty with them, a seven-year treaty, uh, which he will then break. And we notice that his intent here is to use all of these things coming together to make him God and to replace all of the other gods. One of the passages in Daniel, chapter 12, beginning in verse 5. Now, if you go back and read the old context just to fill this in, Gabriel is the one giving Daniel all this information. Gabriel is the one who is telling him, telling him all of this. So now in verse 5, we come to the end of this book. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others. Daniel had seen a vision of an angel standing above the Euphrates River. Daniel said, I looked and I saw two others, one on this side of the river bank and one on the other side. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall it be the fulfillment of these, of these wonders be? How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, that was going to be Gabriel, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand uh, and his left hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half a time. That is, again, how long? Three and a half years. Do you begin to get the picture that three and a half years is a magical number here? I mean, it's a completely continually reoccurring number. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. That's talking about Israel being virtually destroyed. Although I heard, I did not understand, and I said, my Lord... What shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time, here it is, that the daily sacrifice is taken away. When does that happen? At the midpoint of the tribulation, 
three and a half years in, it happens when the Antichrist walks into the temple, puts an end to their sacrifices, demands to be worshipped. From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to take your inheritance at the end of the days. Now we've been introduced to some more times here. Time, times, and a half time, three and a half years. If we use the Jewish calendar, which was uh, 360 days, uh, then three and a half times would come out to 1260 days. Three and a half years would come out to 1260 days. This talks about 1290 days and 1335 uh, days. Here's, here's the possible explanation of that. I say possible because this is, again is one of those things that we don't really know concretely and can state without any reservation this is what it is. But this is the possible explanation of that. Because Daniel's question was, how long before all this is going to be over with? Well, we have 1260 days, which is the three and a half years. Now we have 30 more days. Then we have 45 more days after that to get to the 1335. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Total 75 days. <coughs> Remember we talked last week about the river of blood flowing through through Jerusalem of four and a half feet thick and all that. The to the horse's rattle. Question is, what are these extra 75 days going to be for? We come to the end of the three and a half years, 1260 days. So the tribulation has just ended. The battle of Armageddon has just ended the tribulation period. The battle of Armageddon is what accounts for that river of blood. So what do we need the extra 75 days for? I told you at the beginning of the study I would endeavor to make sure I try to explain to you my opinion about things as opposed to saying that this is what the Bible teaches. So I'm going to tell you my opinion. So you can label that Mortonology instead of theology. <laughs> you got 75 days to bury the dead. To bury the dead. We've just ended the tribulation period, the great tribulation period. Enough people have lost their lives to where it generated this a river of blood to the horse's bridle, which is four and a half feet deep. The millennium is going to begin shortly after that. It's going to take a period of time to start getting all of that mess cleaned up. So, I don't know why it's 1290 days and 1335 days. I just know there's a total of 75 days between the ending of the tribulation period and the beginning of the winter. And the only thing that I can think of to account, and I'm sure people have other opinions, the only thing I can think of to account for that 75 day gap in there is that there's gotta be some measure of cleaning up the mess. Uh, fortunately, most of that's going to be confined to the nation of Israel and to the Middle East. It's not going to be worldwide. It's going to be confined to the Middle Eastern area. Uh, but, again, I'm only offering an opinion as to why, because I don't find any other reference to these, four, these 75 days in any other prophecies uh, other than here in Daniel. And Daniel's question to Gabriel was, when will all of this be over with? And he takes him all the way through to the beginning of the millennium because that's the beginning of the thousand reign of Christ on the earth where everything would be perfect. And so going from the mass loss of life and, and tribulation to there, there's got to be some period of time in there to try to get stuff cleaned up. 
Again, my opinion. We're going to jump over to the New Testament here now um, and look at some verses. But before we do that, anybody got any questions? There's mud. Yes. All I know is I won't be doing the cleaning. <laughs> Let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 15. <laughs> To understand the context in Matthew 24, verse 1, the disciples said to him, Tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That was the disciples' question. What we're going to read is part of the answer he gave to them. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Here we are again. That is whom? Antichrist. There are some speculation that uh, Remember last week we talked about Antiochus Epiphanes for just a little bit, whenever he desecrated the temple. Uh, he did a couple of things. One, he had a statue or he created, life-size statue of himself created, and it was his intent to place that into the temple so the Israelites would have to come in and worship him. But beyond that point, uh, which that, that didn't happen because he ended up getting killed before he could make that happen. But what he did accomplish was they brought in pigs and offered them on the altar, the sacrifice, sacrificial altar in the temple to defile the temple. Pigs were unclean animals. The Jews don't eat pigs. They don't eat you know, pork or anything else. I was over in Israel one time and I was staying in downtown Jerusalem uh, in a hotel and I had met a guy over there and he came. He said, uh, hey, I was here before. There's a little pizza shop here someplace near this hotel. I'm going to go get some pizza. Do you want to go with me? I said, man, I'm not a big pizza fan, but I hadn't had anything American, you know, in a long time. I don't know if pizza American or not, but anyway, I hadn't had anything. At all. I said, yeah, I'll go with you. We get out walking around Jerusalem. He said, I think it's down this corner here. No, 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 it's down that corner over there. So anyway, we were there, and, and I walk into this little pizza shop, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to get some bacon and some uh, pepperoni and some, some spicy sausage. And I looked up at the, at the menu board, and it says, cheese pizza. No bacon, no pork, no, you know, no ham, no, you know, no sausage. And then... I started to say something, and then I realized why it didn't have anything up there. I thought, I'm going to keep my mouth filled. I don't want him to think I'm that stupid. <laughs> and I didn't figure that out. But the pig was a defiled animal, and that was his way of desecrating the temple uh, just to uh, anger them. So the abomination of desolation could be two things. It could be the Antichrist himself standing in the temple, or he could, in connection with that, bring something else in with him that would be very offensive to the Jews, as did any of the Epiphanes do, that would, in fact, uh, also be at the bottom of the temple. But it's generally conceived that the name, the abomination of desolation, is limited or applies to the Antichrist himself going into the temple. Verse 16, Jesus said, when you see this abomination of desolation spoken of by the angel from standing in the holy place, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of the house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. 
And I'm going to start reading there because this is what you need to understand. What Jesus is telling the disciples, <coughs> answering the question, when you see that happen, get out of town. When does the abomination of desolation take place? <coughs> Three and a half years in. It is the beginning, it is the launch of what is called the Great Tribulation Period, the last three and a half years. That's when all of the judgment's going to come. That's when all the war's going to break out. That's, that's when literally all hell is going to break loose those last three and a half years. He says, when you see that happen, get out of town. Don't, don't, if you're on the roof, just get off the roof and go. Now, some have speculated that this may be how God creates the organization of the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes, that he's going to miraculously preserve so that there will be a remnant of the nation of Israel left. I think that's a little stretch to try to say this is going to be this. This is going to be when the Antichrist is going to launch his most massive campaign to annihilate the nation of Israel. So there, he said, just, just get, don't even go back and get your clothes. Just hit the road and try to get out from money because nothing but destruction is going to come. Verse 21, then there will be great tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world unto this time, no, nor ever shall be. <clears throat> and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, here's the question. Was Jesus talking to the disciples as Christians and his church? Or was he talking to them as Jews in the nation of Israel? My opinion is he was talking to them about the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, and that we would be making a mistake to try to apply these things to the church. I think at the time this happens, one way or the other, the church is going to be gone. We're going to already be out of here. So this was written for the benefit of the Jews. So the apostles were then going to be telling the Jewish people even though Jesus spoke these words and he spoke them to his disciples who were his followers, it was not in the context of them being Christians and them being the church in the context of them being Jews in the Jewish nation. And this was the warning going to the Jewish nation of what was going to transpire for them because they're going to receive the brunt of the Antichrist attempt to destroy the nation of Israel. I mean, they're going to be slaughtered like never before. I mean, uh, Hitler did what he could uh, in the Holocaust, but this is going to far, far exceed uh, all of that whenever he starts moving against the Jews. <laughs> so even though the Antichrist is referenced in this passage, it is a reference to his involvement with the Jewish nation, not to the church, not to the Christians. Does that make sense? Because he talks about the Sabbath, he talks about Judea, he talks about, talks about all the things that were pertaining to the Jewish people as opposed to Christian people. Second Thessalonians. Of so everything that I'm going to say, at least tonight, this may be the most controversial. <laughs> passage that we will look at. controversy with this. I'm going to walk this through slowly. 
beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. Paul says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our <coughs> gathering together to him, So you tell me, what do you think this passage is talking about? <coughs> the rapture? Yeah. Everybody agree that with that? <laughs> He's talking about the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. He said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that... Uh, the Lord's going to come with a, with a shout of the trumpet in the air, and we which are alive remain are going to be caught up together. Uh, the dead are going to be rise first, and then we're going to call it, be caught up together. And by the way, you know why the dead rise first? They got followed to go. Huh? They got followed to go. <laughs> <laughs> they got six feet. Uh, <laughs> there may be an element of truth to that in, in all honesty, but we're talking about... The, we're talking about the rapture, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is going to come, and we're going to be gathered together with him. Paul said, regarding that event, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Apparently, somebody sent a letter as if signed by Paul to the church in Thessalonica. And if I may uh, casually paraphrase what the letter perhaps said, seems that the letter said, Hey guys, the day of the Lord has already come and you missed it. If you're still here, it means you missed it because he's already come. Paul said, do not be soon shaken. In. Would that shake your mind? If you got a letter, remember they didn't have the Bible completed yet. Nobody had a copy of the Bible and all of this wasn't Paul was just now starting to write this stuff down. And so they had nothing to go on except what Paul had taught them in the past. And you get this letter from this guy named Paul. Uh, and he said, hey, the Lord's already come and you guys missed it. He said, do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Let no one, verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The day of his coming, the rapture, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. That falling away has reference to apostasy uh, or pretty much as we know toward the end of time, the whole world is going to reject uh, the Bible, reject anything of God and so on. Uh, he said unless they're coming, that would be a worldwide falling away from the truth. Unless that day a falling away comes first, and the man of sin, that's who? Antichrist, Antichrist is revealed. Now I need to stop here because if you look at your definitions, <laughs> this is what I want you to see. Third one down, see it says appearance versus revelation. There is a difference between the appearance and the revelation in these events. Let me ask you this, this is not only here, but let me ask you this question. When did Jesus uh, begin his ministry? At what age? generally conceived about 30 years of age. If he appeared on the scene, right? 
uh, he had he had uh, been living at home and working with his father and the uh, uh, earthly father and all that. So at the age of 30, he launches his public ministry. He makes an appearance on the scene. When was he actually revealed to be the Messiah? At his, at his, at his death and resurrection, right? Now, did, I mean, the apostles and the other believers, 120 of them, I mean, they had to, by faith, believe that that's, that's who he was. Remember what the Roman soldiers said when Jesus was on the cross? Truly, this man was the Son of God. Do you see what I mean about appearance and revelation? Well, what would you do with, when Jesus was baptized? <laughs> that was the launching of his ministry. That was his appearance on the scene. And the disciples who were there with him when he saw that. But I'm talking about his being revealed. Because what revealed him? His power over the grave, right? His, his resurrection from the grave. Because he went in, he went into the city and appeared to many and, and hundreds of other Old Testament saints. They were re resurrected at the same time. Uh, and as they said about Peter, he said he appeared to over 500 witnesses at once. I'm thinking about the, the uh, dove coming to see him. And, and that was something that done. that was something that the only people that saw that were the disciples who were with him there on the river. That was the launching. That was his appearance of his ministry. Let's go to the rapture. Um, when Jesus comes in the rapture, is he being revealed or is he just putting in an appearance? Let me rephrase that. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 talks about when Jesus comes literally the second time back to the earth. It says, every eye shall see him. Right? That's when he's actually coming back to the earth. The rapper, he doesn't come back to the earth. He just comes into the air and we meet him up there. So, that would be Jesus, the rapture would be Jesus' appearance. His revelation would be when he comes back to, in the second coming all the way to the earth. So, when did the Antichrist appear? Beginning of the tribulation period, when he makes the treaty, right? When is he revealed for who he is? When he stands in the temple. Okay, so Paul is saying, let no man deceive you by any means, verse 3, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is restraining the forces of evil today? The Holy Spirit. Until the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth, the forces of evil, as bad as it is right now, uh, the Holy Spirit is still holding that force of evil back. Verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only you now restrains will do so until you take them away. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the second coming at the end of the three and a half years. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, but that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. 
that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, timing is, our timing is about up, and this is going to be good because I can get out of here quick uh, before you start asking all these questions. <laughs> I don't know if, if you're following the logic here of this passage. I will tell you what I think it says. Uh, there are other opinions. I can assure you there are other opinions about this. Reading this passage is my understanding and my belief that the rapture is going to take place just preceding the revealing of the Antichrist going into the temple, which means that's in three and a half years. Somebody asked me when I go, are you pre-trib or mid-trib? I said, I'll let you know. <laughs> so I'm letting you know. Uh, I do believe, based on this passage, that Paul said that the coming of the Lord and our being gathered together to him is going to happen. And in the process of that happening, it's going to be preceded by falling away from the truth and the revelation of the man of sin. And he makes it clear what that revelation is whenever he enters the temple and sits in the temple and says he is God and demands to be worshipped as God. So, any questions? My challenge to you is to study the word. Uh, don't ever take anything I say or anybody else says uh, to be the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so after God. Uh, I have been wrong. If you need evidence, you can talk to Peggy after we dismiss her. <laughs> she maintains a list in her, in her pocketbook. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I have changed my opinion down through the years. The more I study, the more I think I understand things better. But um, I try not to be wrong on the big stuff. Uh, I try not to be wrong on salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and without of works. And I try not to be wrong on the really big stuff. So, and I, and I told you the little, the, the little quip earlier in the year when the um, Watusi tribe goes on a war path that pygmies tread softly when there, you have giants uh, in Bible knowledge out there that disagree on some of these things. I just try to tread softly. But I've read these passages multiple times, and of all the passages that I've read in terms of the rapture uh, and the Antichrist and all that connection, this to me has been the most powerful one in terms of spelling out what that means. So that's why I am what I am in terms of what I believe. However, uh, you may read and come to different conclusion and we'll still be friends. You'll be wrong, but we'll still be friends. <laughs> I always heard that we never know who the Antichrist was. Do you think we will or will be? The thing about that is we may be able to see the evidence that the Antichrist has come and is at work Obviously, whenever the Jews start building the temple, something's up. But we will never know. You know, somebody says, well, if I believe that, then that means I can figure out exactly what day the Lord's going to come. No, you couldn't. Um, number one, uh, we're not going to know when that tree is signed. That's going to be something that's going to be done in secret between uh, Antichrist and Israel. We will know the outcome, but that may be months down the road or, or maybe a year or two down the road. So we're not going to be able to predict all this stuff. Um, and uh, I try to be honest in my interpretation of scriptures and try to share that with you. However, if I'm wrong and, it, and Jesus comes first, I'm not complaining. <laughs> if it's free trip and, and we're out of here before, we are out of here before all of the wrath or revelation takes place. Either way. Now, there will be persecution in those first two and a half years because guess what? If we're here, in those first three and a half years, and we are a people of God, and we're trying to still be faithful to God and, and represent God while we're here, and we refuse the mark of the beast, uh, we're going to become marked people. 
and there's going to be and there's going to be persecution. But let me tell you something. If you go back and look at the entire movement of God, especially in the New Testament church era, from the time Jesus himself was here walking the earth until this present day, here's what I think you'll discover. God's work has always flourished and grown under persecution far more than it ever has under prosperity. If I've got a five dollar bill in my wallet, I'm you know, if I'm hungry, you know, I don't I just stop and get a burger or something. If I have no money in my pocket and no prospect of any money in my pocket, guess what's gonna to happen to my prayer life? It's gonna be ratcheted up several hundred degrees. I'm just saying that history has proven that the movements of God, the great revivals that broke out of throughout Europe, even throughout America, all started with persecution. Uh, and there's no doubt because uh, when we get into Revelation chapter five and the seals there, the, those who lose their lives during the tribulation period are saying to God, how long do we wait? And he said to your fellow believers, join you. So there will be persecution. <coughs> uh, that being said, uh, we I, I can't say whether we'll face some of that or not, or you know, it, would it be around? I mean, it could be another 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 100 years before all this finally unwinds. So, one, <clears throat> excuse me. One time I asked President of Baptist Seminary, Southern Baptist Seminary, about the, uh, see how far you felt about the rapture. He told me that's a secondary issue. There are a lot so of, a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of churches and pastors, and I understand that do not want this talk only because some of these passages, such as this one here, uh, has generated such a controversy within the church that now he's got to go back as the <clears throat> pastor. And I will tell you. <clears throat> Before I ever agreed to do this class, I sat with Pastor Ronnie in his office, and I went through everything here. I said, "I want you to know that if I do this, this is this is where I'm coming from." And I said, "And if you have any objection, if you have any any concern about this at all, you just say the word, and I won't be doing it. <clears throat> I'll, I'll do a very broad overview and, and not get into some of these details." He said, "Nope, just." I need you to just teach the truth. So also some pastors refuse to speak on the book of Revelation. Can you speak up? Can you speak up? I said some pastors <coughs> refuse to speak or teach the book of Revelation. Yeah. Oh. Let me repeat that because of the recording. Uh, the question that was being asked or the comment being made was that there are some pastors and, and other denominational leaders or whatever. Uh, that don't encourage the book of Revelation or don't want that taught uh, because, in my opinion, primarily because they've seen the discord sometimes they can create. And the last thing we need to do is hand Satan another weapon he used to kind of uh, undermine. But uh, we're doing this study together and and I, and I being fair and honest and trustworthy and truthful and all that, I can't ignore certain passages because they may generate questions. I will tell you that there's no hard, fast, black and white guarantee on any of this. Uh, I had a, told some of you this, I had a friend years ago wrote a book on why Jesus Christ is gonna come and I don't know what it was, 1992 or whatever it is. And I, I said, Nikki, I said, if you got that right, the Lord would change that date. <laughs> Just so you wouldn't be right. Uh, we don't know the day or the hour. That doesn't mean we can't narrow that down to a little bit broader range. So we don't know the day or the hour when that's gonna happen. So we just have to leave everybody that accordingly. According to what you were saying, do you think that the mark of the beast will happen before we're taken to heaven? That he will be in power? When the, when we'll get into that when we get to the false prophet. Uh, so let me wait till we get over there because he's the one who's going to instigate that. Uh, but yes, it probably will. Okay. It becomes an it becomes a mark of allegiance to him. 
Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's get late. Uh, Mike, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Hey, Father Lord, we just, again, we come to you and we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I thank you for David and just the, all that he's doing to bring the truth of your word to us. And Lord, uh, again, just be with each one of us, Lord. Just uh, allow us to go out and be uh, witness, witnesses for you and speak your word and be able to show the love of Christ to those that we meet. And again, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>